And it's the Titterpigs, the RPG podcast. Am I getting paid for this one? <laughs> All right, listeners, welcome back to episode, this is 17. Uh, in the studio today with us, we have game designer, prolific author, podcaster, and all-around good guy, Ken Height. Hey, thanks for having me on, guys. Thanks for coming to hang out with us. You are very, very welcome, Ken. It's a, it's a pleasure to have you on. Um, aside from Keith's introduction, uh, if you wouldn't mind just taking a moment, just telling our listeners a little bit about yourself, because... I know most of our listeners know who you are with, without question. In fact, they are excited for this podcast to drop. Uh, but for those who don't, much like come to find out, my son and his gaming group at high school started listening to our podcast, so they may not be aware who you are. So if you can just uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, we would definitely appreciate it. Well, I am down with the kids, but the kids have to, as you allude, be pretty old by now. Um, <laughs> I have been a full-time game designer and writer since the late 90s. I got my start with uh, GURPS and Nephilim. I then did two Star Trek games back-to-back, -back, one for Last Unicorn and one for Decipher, which mm -hmm. I don't recommend as an experience, but I do recommend as a great way to learn game design. Uh, <laughs> I did a bunch of work for Old White Wolf. Uh, then cycled into uh, Steve Jackson again, then started up with Pelgrane. I wrote uh, Trail of Cthulhu for them in 2008 for the gumshoe system. And from that point on have been uh, basically the Costello to Robbins Abbott or whichever direction this uh, energy goes. Uh, and Robin likes to say his job is to take things out of gumshoe and my job is to put things back into gumshoe. <laughs> so Trail of Cthulhu, I followed up with Knights Black Agents and uh, Fall of Delta Green. I also did Bubble Gumshoe for Evil Hat. Uh, and then, of course, Robin and I uh, do a podcast. Ken and Robin talk about stuff. And I guess most recently, uh, probably the biggest credit I'm ever going to have, uh, barring the unlikely, is that I was lead designer on the fifth edition of Vampire the Masquerade. So uh, if any of the kids out there were were drama kids back in the day, maybe they know Vampire. And I did, uh, I, I, I headed up a, a team of really great designers. I didn't just do it my own self. Uh, but we put together uh, the fifth edition, which is now, uh, you know, in print and taking the world by storm, or so I'm informed. Well, I have my copy, so. Fantastic. Excellent. Well, there we go. Mission accomplished. Excellent. Yeah, I don't. None of my kids are drama kids, but they are teenagers, so they're dramatic. So it's it's right. a lateral step from there. At any moment, they could suddenly get puffy shirt energy and then vampire. Right? It's possible. <laughs> well, they can't borrow mine. That's for sure. <laughs> All right. All right. Well, that's that's some credentials. So, but mm -hmm. so we're here to talk about alt history, alternative, alternate history. I, I know you 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 do some writing on that. Have a, a litany of things, articles, and books you've written on that. So we kind of want to delve into that for our listeners. So as Scott alluded to, us, a lot of our listeners, uh, generally the older crowd, are, are super excited for this episode to drop. So just kind of a, a, a foundational question. Um, do you, and, and cause just because I don't know the answer, and I'm sure most don't, do you have an academic background in history, or are you just, like like me, a lover of history? Well, I was I was raised to be a lover of history by my dad, who, you know, very much like Doc Savage was raised by his dad to fight crime. Uh, mm -hmm. My dad uh, did not marry a history buff, and so he decided to create one. Uh, and then my academic background, uh, I got an undergraduate degree in cartography with a minor in poli sci. And then when I went to grad school at the University of Chicago, I got a master's in international relations 
with a focus in international history. So mm -hmm. yes and no, I guess, is the answer to academic historical background. Okay. I, I, I barely have one or I sort of have one, a toe in that uh, water. But most of my big what if energy has come from, you know, uh, basically being, you know, raised on a heavy gravity planet uh, by my father. That's cool. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah. it's, that's better than my background. I mean, I, I attempted to tr do two master's degrees in two different history disciplines and never finished, but <laughs> yeah, well, I, um, uh, I did the terminal master's program at the university of Chicago, which, uh, you know, it's a great, I mean, it's the largest open stacks library, I think in the world, certainly in the hemisphere. Um, so it was very much a, I don't know, go study kid. Very, you know, that was the old UFC. I don't know if they still do that now, but it was, you know, just a, a great time. And I could, I could go pester other people doing their dissertation defenses or their, or not their dis defenses, but their sort of proposal talks. So right. I, I, I had a good time, you know, reading what they were going to talk about and then raising my hand and being an idiot, a, a jerk, uh, not an idiot, <laughs> but an annoyance. Let's say that. Yeah, I love so that, that, you know, that killed lots of time. And then in, um, at the university of Chicago, I met Craig Newmeyer and Mike Schiffer at the gaming club and science fiction club. And we started doing, well, I said University of Chicago at the top of the hour, but this is the nerdiest imaginable version of playing the dozens. But what we would do would be sort of an alternate history, exquisite corpse rap battle. So one of us would start by changing history, run it off to some crazy degree, and then stop. And the other person would have to continue it from that until you got down to the present. And that was sort of a thing we would do to show off and, and, uh, and stunt on each other, uh, in terms of, you know, sort of how, how wild can you make the history and still have a thin thread of plausibility through it. And that sort of energy is what led us to write, uh, GURPS alternate earths for Steve, uh, Jackson, uh, when we did that back in 1996, whatever year it was. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, we basically, Way back in the day, I mean, I'm sure he does still, but there was a what do we want to see page on the Steve Jackson, you know, BBS and on their newsletter. And so we thought, oh, time travel settings, we can do those alternate histories. We proposed it. Steve accepted. And we did two volumes of that. And so when I came back to Steve uh, uh, to uh, be a staff writer for him for a couple of years, the project he gave me was the GURPS Infinite Worlds, which was sort of the big you know, sort of setting book to go with GURPS fourth edition. Nice. And so that uh, sort of cemented that, that habit. I've done lots of other alternate history and time travel stuff here and there. Mm -hmm. And then of course on the podcast, we have a regular segment called Ken's time machine where I go yeah. back and change the past uh, at the behest of either one of the listeners or Robin uh, being an agent provocateur as he often is. <laughs> Nice. Yeah, the the back and forth of those are always always a a joy to listen to. Sometimes they they are parallel, and other times there there's a little bit of a divergence between the two. So it's good to listen and and learn from that. Mm -hmm. Um. So, uh, question for you: being you know being what you've done, being you know the, the the many many things that you've written in regards to gaming and specifically alt history. Some people might think that there's a bit of a uh, divergence in definition of what is alt history by your own words what is your definition of what you consider to be alt history you know a, a guideline to what that might mean well i mean i'm of the old school that sort of differentiates between what we call alternate history mm -hmm. where there is a uh, a change in the timeline that shows up in the newspapers and in the you know world almanac and wikipedia so if i went to that timeline and i looked up wikipedia under civil war it would say the Confederates won the Civil War at the Battle of Antietam or whatever. Right. And that for me is sort of the purest version of alt history. Now, um, you can argue that any historical novel is alternate history because it adds a character to history that wasn't there. Um, I think that's relatively minor. I don't see something like Sharps Rifles or Hornblower as being alternate history. I see that as historical adventure fiction, like has been going on since, you know, the, you know, since since the Aeneid, basically. Um, but uh, there's a sort of a, a, a side or lobe or second branch of alternate history that I do use an awful lot, and that's what 
a lot of people call secret history. And that's okay. the history is as we know it. But secretly, if you were woke, you would know that it was run by Cthulhu or vampires or, you know, uh, ancient elven conspiracies or whatever kind of a thing. And that can be and that encompasses a lot of, you know, things like, you know, from the masquerade and vampire to the call of Cthulhu and all the Cthulhu lines. Uh, and so any sort of, as Robin puts it, nerd troped game generally posits some sort of secret history. Right. Because otherwise, you know, and no, no possible uh, offense intended. You're just, you're just playing recon, right? You're just out there, you know, and, and that can be fun certainly, but I, in my play, and I think most gamers prefer to have a little magic or a little monsters or something, you know, outside the the absolutely normal but i think alternate history is i mean you can certainly combine the two you can mm -hmm. have a world in which you know the the nazis developed uh you know uh real science and had giant mechs that you know stormed europe or something that would be both a secret history and an alternate history but uh i think there are two lobes that do interpenetrate but aren't the same thing Excellent. Yeah. No, that 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 clarifies it because that that kind of that that answers one of one of the questions that I was going to be presenting. You know, the difference between alternate history and you had mentioned uh, secret history in some of your previous articles and whatnot. So that mm -hmm. kind of that clarifies it for me because there's yeah. some people might think it al alternate history encompasses it all: the vampires behind the scenes and the the Nazis developing some secret technology. But there's a difference between the two. So, yeah. Yeah. Excellent. So kind of as a I guess a follow up to that. <clears throat> so, you know, you said like kind of in its purest form, I cuz I'm a I'm a history lover. It's kind of my thing, right? And I like alternate history. You know, is there aside from what you've already suggested like, you know, um the Confederates won the Civil War at Antietam or, you know, the Nazis did X, Y, and Z and the war changed and all of that. Are there is there any advice you can offer us and listeners for altering historical facts to give the appearance of an alt history without being overly divergent, you know, so it doesn't just scream it's fantasy, you know, does that make sense? I mean, yeah. I mean, to some extent, uh, read enough history and you'll know what sounds plausible and what doesn't sound plausible. That's fair. Yeah. Um, uh, there is no universe in which the Mayans uh, could have built ships, sailed across the Atlantic and conquered Spain, even though we might feel like they deserve to, because they'd all die of smallpox like the instant they got off the boat. So you have levels uh, of, of plausibility and levels of implausibility. I think for a, a pure alt history, you want to err on the side of plausibility. But I think my my best technique that I can offer is... Uh, to do the opposite of what seems normal, uh, don't start with your divergence point and go forward. Start with what you want the story to be or the game to be, the setting to be, and work backward. So if you say, I want to be in a world where uh, Napoleon's empire survived, you know, don't go back to, you know, Leipzig or whatever, you know, start and say, what do I want this world to be like? Do I want Napoleon's empire to be in a cold war with a bunch of other countries? That says one thing. Do I want it to be a, a sort of global hegemon uh, like America in the 90s? Do I want it to be corrupt and beaten down and broken? Uh, or do I want it to be, you know, reaching for the stars and energetic? What kind of setting do I want? And then you sort of get into your, your stuffiest BBC narrator voice and you say, in retrospect, it was inevitable that, you know, the Bonapartist right. empire should shake off the doldrums of the late 19th century and re-energize itself because, and that's where hopefully your answer will fall out because it was able to uh, incorporate, you know, uh, you know, new science from India because it was able to um, uh, tr truly democratize the university, whatever thing it is that you want the future your, or your setting, your present to look like. You set up, and so you'll find yourself sort of driving those load-bearing pillars into the past of your setting. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you start from Leipzig and you say, all right, Napoleon wins Leipzig, and now you're like, well, now what? We've still got all these other armies. Okay, uh, he wins Leipzig. Um, uh, he 
knocks the Russians out of the war by killing the czar in a battle. And now the czar, the czarevich Constantine is weird and messed up and the soldiers won't follow him. So Russia, far right. But still, we've got, well, we've still got that bleeding ulcer in Spain. I don't know how to deal with it. So what you, what you do is if you know you want a, you know, upwardly mobile, confident, Napoleonic present, you want to have your change point as far back as you can to avoid all the mistakes that Napoleon made. So maybe uh, one of my favorites is uh, instead of invading Egypt in 1799 or in 1798, he invades Ireland. Mm -hmm. um, and suddenly, if he sets up a Hibernian Republic, uh, Britain is, they're screwed. Uh, they can't defend against that. And he can invade Britain at his leisure, take them out of the war without them funding all of his enemies. He gets to do whatever he wants. And uh, so you can, you know, establish that the divergence point is is pre-empire. And so maybe the, the Republican spirit is a little stronger, even if he does still declare himself emperor because you want vive l'emperor and things. But, you know, you say, oh, well, obviously the Irish and the Dutch and the Swiss and the Poles, all the sort of Republican radical powers are part of the empire in a way that they were not under, you know, the later sort of, um, uh, you know, uh, 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 arthritic uh, Napoleonic empire after, you know, Berezina and Borodino. So you, you can sort of be building that uh, as a load bearing member. And then you realize, Oh, my real weak point is, you know, what happens uh, with Russia. So I have to make sure that bad things keep happening to Russia to keep them off the geopolitical stage. Or my weak point is America. Maybe I don't want the Americans to be a, a threat. So I've got to have a big throwdown war between America and Napoleon that happened, you know, 80 years ago in America. You know, maybe that's when Napoleon develops the A-bomb or the Napoleon, uh, the French develop the A-bomb and they, you know, decapitate America. That's what we have. But then that's going to, you know, establish a thing about your setting that you'll need to know. So basically it's working backwards, I find, is the key to building a setting that's going to withstand play and withstand plausibility. Because if you work forwards, you may come up with a really great idea for a novel, but you're not going to come up with a particularly compelling game setting, I don't think. I'm over uh, here scribbling notes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Keep talking. <laughs> no, that's I, I think that's like super sound advice. Um, I mean, a lot of this is, right. is in GURPS Infinite Worlds, which is sort of where I did right. my last summa on that Orion uh, Wild Talents. Um, right. The, uh, the game from uh, Greg Stolze and uh, uh, Arc Dream. Right. Sort of the superhero uh, game, Dennis Detweller, uh, that had supers in World War II. And uh, they brought me in when they did the expanded version to do a how to build a superheroic alternate history. So if you take, you know, that as sort of the poor example of nerd troping history, and then the GURPS Infinite World stuff that I did, you have a pretty good, uh, you know, Old and New Testament, I guess, of my alternate history building. <laughs> So that 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 is a key set. That's that's sound advice. You know, you mm -hmm. you even if you have a good idea to work off of, you know, like you know Edison is receiving Carcosan transmissions on his dictaphone, you still should have a setting in place to place that into, or at least flesh that out. Mm -hmm. um, something as such. Um, so you've written several things about about art, art history. You 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 mentioned the um, uh, the GURPS uh, alter, alternative Earths. And uh, a lot of a lot of your previous articles in, that uh, also really highlight a lot of this is uh, in suppressed transmissions. Yeah, too. you you mention in in one of the articles in there in suppressed transmissions regarding um, you know some of the tools to work with, and one of the ones that you mentioned is uh, slightly alternate history. Yeah, how does that come into play in in regards to what you what you're already talking about uh, if you're setting this up? It's it. From what I, from what I've read, it seems to be a, a different take or, or, or a different uh, path to go down to ultimately get the game that you're looking to to run or play. Yeah, a slightly altered history is is almost um, about the table more than it is about the the game design project. Okay. I don't know that anyone wants to buy a a role playing book where the only differences are that Reagan is on the nickel and Britney Spears was a country singer, right? But when you're at the table, especially if you're in a game that is meant to be uh, a historical sort of a game, mm -hmm. if you alter something slightly, you're giving the players a little bit of breathing room and a little bit of permission. So 
if you know they're you know wandering around uh cowboy times and they hear uh james garfield has just survived his assassination and he's going to still be president well that's going to change literally nothing about american history i mean the civil service act gets moved down a couple of pegs but other than that nothing really happens but it lets them know oh we have permission to change stuff right, right? we can maybe kill doc holiday if he steps to us we don't have to know that he's going to die you know 10 years from now in a colorado sanitarium we have permission mm-hmm. to you know go after billy the kid uh, we don't have to wait for pat garrett to take him out and so that sort of I think allows character players a little breathing room. And then if you do it in a, um, uh, a game where the details are part of the game, like in a conspiracy game, you know, the fact that uh, John F. Kennedy was shot by a guy named Conrad Schluten, you're like, well, that, that seems like that's not what happened. Right. And then they look into <laughs> it and it turns out that a mysterious uh, you know, a bunch of uh, government guys grabbed Lee Harvey Oswald off the street and dragged him away. But sure enough, Kennedy was still shot by a guy named Con- Conrad Schluten. And now it's like, oh, this is a mystery. This is part of the world that I get to explore a little bit and dig into. And so it's a signal to the players that, oh, all is not what it seems. And um, so uh, so I guess the, the sort of the three levels are scenery, which is the, you know, Britney Lynn Spears country recording artist of the year. Uh, there is permission, and then there is as a signal that something is going on, that this is an element of the story that you need to know. So if if they're, you know, um, and, and I guess the, the trick there is to make sure that the players know that you're not an idiot. So <laughs> if, if you're saying, well, Heinrich Himmler disappeared in the ruins of Nazi Germany and was never found again, they have to know that, you know, no, he really committed suicide like a big old coward. Um, right. He was not spirited away by the Thule Bruderschaft to Antarctica or whatever your game says. Yeah. Right. Um, I, mean, I mean, in my personal opinion, there are ample Nazis that did disappear that you don't need to do that to Himmler. But I feel like um, uh, that is another way to, to sort of signal to players, oh, there's something has changed. Maybe we're in a time travel game and we don't know it. Maybe we're definitely in a conspiracy game and we don't know it. Or right. we we do know it, but now we know a little bigger, and, and so it uh, that's the role for that. It's not again, um, right. although God knows people might be different. I think um, Haunted West actually is is almost a really good example of that uh, because uh, Chris Spivey, when he did the game, he did it explicitly with a slightly altered reconstruction mm-hmm. because he wanted a slightly different uh, status of uh, blacks in the West then right. was historically accurate. Um, and so that was what he did. And so it, it's a, in, in a way that actually does drive play in a way. So uh, forget what I said about it never actually happening. Um, right. Chris Spivey did a great job and, and made it actually happen. But, but it again, that that turns out to be a, a, um, uh, a, a pillar underneath the setting. And in a way, right. it's like Chris has his eye down the road on whatever that America is going to turn into in the 21st century. Right. And we have the privilege of being present at the creation. And and so I, I feel like I feel like Chris is maybe playing a long game and has got something cunning up his sleeve. That's an but, interesting way to look at it. But but in the moment, Haunted West is that sort of slightly alternate history. And um again, part of it is that, oh, history's not quite as we remember. Maybe there are, you know, uh Martians and dust devils and skinwalkers and God knows what lurking around. Right. Well, I'm sure Chris most certainly does, and I definitely look forward to that 1,500-page uh, mm-hmm. tome that he's going to come out My with. My bad after. back doesn't. Absolutely. <laughs> Haunted Now is going to be 3,500 pages. Woo. <laughs> oh, so excellent, be, excellent. Also, quantum bound. You want it what? Leather bound? It'll be oh, quantum, quantum bound. bound. Oh, quantum bound. <laughs> it's the only way you're going to be able to hold it together yeah. with uh, super strings. Yeah, exactly. Um, so also in suppressed transmissions you you have a a short piece on hollow history yeah can you can you tell listeners a little bit about hollow what hollow history is and what it means to you and how you use it i mean i i generally don't use it because it's very confusing um but it is great fun it's a uh I learned about it, not most people now know about it from a Russian uh, guy named Fomenko, who has written 
uh, sort of the uh, uh, what I want to say magnum opus on the topic, but there was a, a German. I hesitate to use the word scholar, a guy named Herbert Illig, whose thesis was that uh, there was a big hole in the history of the Dark Ages, and that mm-hmm. when Otto makes himself Holy Roman Emperor and decides it's the millennium, he just made that up. That actually, there's about 200 years missing from the history of the Dark Ages, and Otto just made it up. Mm-hmm. And you see a similar thing. Vilikovsky had the same thing with the history of the Bronze Age. Um, post Vilikovskians like David Roll have a theory that, you know, the Egyptian dynasty has sort of been overprinted so that it, Egyptian history is actually shorter than we think it is. But this guy, Fomenko, has sort of the, you know, absolute bananas version, which is that history began uh, about 1453. And everything that we think we know about history is because we were non-Russian barbarians. And when the Russians civilized us, they taught us their history. And we just made up that it was our history. So when we talk about the Roman Empire, we're making something up that was based on what we heard about the Russian Empire. <laughs> right. And wow. he, pur- he purports to have a bunch of um, uh, eclipses and things that that make his argument Um Certainly, Egyptologists have done themselves no favors uh, by having a uh, remarkably uh, hidebound uh, set of opinions about Egyptian chronology that are being exploded to some extent by uh, dendrochronology and uh, ice core samples and things like that. Mm -hmm. But by and large, I feel very confident that uh, the American West uh, is not a... um, hallucination based on the Russian settlement of Siberia. I, I feel fairly confident that um, uh, the uh, the Bible did not occur in Moscow. I'm, I'm just pretty sure that uh, the Trojan War did not happen in the Baltic. Uh, and right. all of these sorts of <laughs> um, wild uh, notions that history is this sort of endlessly repeating uh, uh, image you know, ever badly, ever more badly Xeroxed from the original Russian. I mean, it's fascinating. It's it's right. an amazing mental concept to play with. It's great fun. And when I discovered Herbert Ellig doing it, it seemed very original to me because I, mm-hmm. I, barring Velikovsky, no one had done that. And certainly no one had done that with sort of AD history. You know, they were happily, you know, mushing up the second and third millennium BC, but Right. You know, gun to your head, very few people care or know anything about the second and third millenniums BC. Um, so that was relatively irrelevant. But when you start saying, oh, no, you know, Columbus is is just a myth. He was made up. It's about this other Russian guy. And you've, you know, and you've just told yourself that. That's fascinating to me. I, I, I'm a big fan. A fan is the wrong word. But I certainly right. I, I certainly recognize the, the joy of it. But how you would do that in a game? I can't yeah. imagine because it, just explaining it is is going to make three quarters of the people's eyes just glaze over completely, and you'll never be able to play it in a game. the The way to do it is maybe make there be a, a Russian mystical, excuse me, a Russian mystical group that is trying to make that be the truth, right? And they've got some artifact from the fictive past that if they can use it, they will erase the past such that it's always been Russia. And I play around with that, which I stole from Mary Gentle's uh, novel, Ash. Um, mm-hmm. I play around with that in Gerb's Madness dossier, which is where I think hollow history is is the thing that I most play with. Uh, but even there, you'll note that the hollow history begins before like 535 AD. It's still ancient times. It's not, right. um, uh, you know, Otto von Bismarck <laughs> didn't exist type stuff. <laughs> right. That that is crazy. I mean, that is absolutely like bananas off the yeah, rails. Yeah. I mean, there was a, a British. Uh, I think he was an Anglican uh, uh, cleric who wrote a, a a thesis that Napoleon was actually a mythical character. But I I think to some extent he was pulling the legs of the French. I don't think he right. meant it. I mean, it's a great book. I, I I enjoyed reading it. But again, I think it was a little bit of you know Victorian mess around. I don't think it was quite as seriously meant as this desperately weird guy, Fomenko. <laughs> right. 
Well, a lot of people in history like pulling the uh, legs of the French. Yeah, so it's, 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 a, it's a common habit. <laughs> oh, excellent. Excellent. Um, so where do we go from here? Um, is there anything, uh, before we move on to our next lead question, dealing with the alt history aspect of the game, uh, you know, building up, as you, as you stated, you know, the scenery, the permission, the signal, and also at, at the table itself, uh, anything else that you care to add to this that we may not have asked or touched upon? Well, I mean, I think I, I, you know, I've got two books worth of things I could add to it, mm -hmm. but rather than, you know, repeat right. them, I'll let, right. I'll let you go through into the next question, uh, because, okay. you know, um, I, I can literally do this all day and I yeah. feel like somehow this is not the ideal use of the podcast time. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I mean, Keith has got to go pack. I don't. I can sit here. And, I can sit here with my, with my hand on my chin and just listen for hours. So there's no problem. Or you there. could go. But read, yeah, no. You could go read Ken's books. I, I do. I do. I have yeah. those. Um, but um, okay. So moving on to another lead question. So one of the questions we have here is in regards to aspects, you know, within history, making changes to them, making them an alternate history and and whatnot, or you know, as we go through, change the scenery and and permission and signal and all that. Do you feel that there are aspects within our history that might be considered too taboo uh, to create an alternate version of? And are there any like no-go zones that you feel that people just shouldn't touch upon? Well, I mean, I don't like to lecture other people and right. say, you know, your art is invalid. Mm -hmm. um, I, However, if you are doing an alternate history where, uh, you know, uh, the Holocaust was a conspiracy and it didn't happen and we're all being lied to, I will right. give you the side eye because that, you know, feeds into a lot of very contemptible people. Likewise, mm -hmm. I think that if you are doing an alternate history that centers on, um, uh, like, uh, to go back to Haunted West, the African-American experience, right. and you're making it so that, um, uh, even what agency they possessed is stripped further from them. Right. I would maybe say maybe not the best of taste, but you know, you have to look at how things come out. I mean, there is a book called uh, the iron dream by Norman Spinrad. That is a science fiction novel uh, written by an Adolf Hitler who emigrated to America instead of taking over Europe. And it is on the surface the most horrifically racist, fascist, awful thing you've ever read. But Spinrad is saying, first of all, this is not so far from science fiction as is currently practiced. He's making a political argument. Right. So, you know, again, if someone rushes up to me and says, Ken, I'm going to do the uh, role-playing game that Hitler would have done, I will have questions. <laughs> but right. I'm not going to say two core, never do that. But I will say, you know, certainly if it's your first time out, stick to what you know, mm -hmm. stick to, you know, something that you um, uh, have done the research on. Absolutely. Right. Mm -hmm. And don't just sort of, because it sounds fun, make an America that didn't happen to have Indians in it. Right. Right. I mean, there's a, there's a fantasy series out there that is just that. And I'm sure it's terrific fun to read, but on some level, if I were a Native American, I might be a little ticked off. Right. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I kind of feel that question almost kind of answers itself. Yeah. But, uh, but again, I'm not I'm not the I'm not the judge. I'm not, you know, the, right. the king of alternate history. Mm -hmm. Whatever you do, just mm -hmm. know, know the minefield you're walking through is, I guess, the right. best advice I can give. Right. Be, be aware of those side eyes that you've been getting. Yes, for exactly. Time. Right. <laughs> No, that's that's good advice. Um, that kind of so I got a follow up question to that, and, and you kind of already answered a little bit, but maybe maybe there's some some room to expound on it. So talking about like an alternate America that doesn't have native cultures, right? Would definitely get the side eye from a lot of people, uh, <laughs> myself included. But bigger picture, though, what are your thoughts just in general on altering cultural history versus like historical events? So actually tapping into uh, changing, say, First Nations or First Peoples cultural history in the attempt at making an alternate history setting or scenario for a particular game. I mean, some of the problem is that if you're altering something nobody knows about, it suddenly becomes uh, indistinguishable from sloppy research. 
Right. Okay. So if I say, no, these are alternate Apaches, and it doesn't look like I know anything about the Apaches, what it looks like is just I'm lazy. Um, so that's the, the question there. I mean, you could definitely, um, there's a, uh, there, there's a, not a, a short story or a novella by Michael Chabon called tough Jews. That's about, um, uh, some, uh, sort of, uh, Jewish, uh, sword fighters in a fantasy, like the Khazar empire era, 10th century AD circa, I believe. And, uh, Chabon is sort of doing a, what if the Jews fought back ever? Wouldn't that be great? I mean, leaving aside uh, Maccabees in Israel. But, you know, what if? Uh, what if they were tough? What if there weren't endless medieval pogroms against them? And I think, you know, that's interestingly done. Chabon's a great writer. He does it really well. Um, and uh, making a culture more badass rather than less badass is probably safer than doing it the other way. Um, I, and you could look at um, other uh, aspects. So, uh, there is uh, the the historical phenomenon of what they call the praying Indians uh, versus the you know unconverted Indians in New England in the 17th century, and you could do a sort of maybe you wanted to do an alternate King Philip's War where it becomes a religious war and there's a bunch of praying Indians that are sweeping west and conquering uh, the unconverted Indians, and that would be an interesting thing to do. And but you again would you'd have to signpost yes I've done my research. Here are right. my footnotes. I'm not just being lazy uh, because I wanted a bunch of Christian Indians. I, I'm really engaging with the history as it is, because that to me is really the meat and the fun of history is to sort of play it fair and look at the actual history and and say what could have happened, what might not have happened. Okay. But again, it, it's all about what are you doing it for? Are you doing it to set up a an amazingly weird sort of a uh, Roman empire feeling 17th century Puritan America? Are you doing mm -hmm. um, it to be the backdrop of some other history that you've got in the present? How core is it to your setting that you've right. got these uh, culturally altered other people? Um, again, don't be put in a box where people can accuse you of just having not done the research. Um, right. Because, First of all, it's embarrassing. And second of all, Fair. Um, <laughs> that is probably a sign that you uh, that you didn't actually do your research. <laughs> and they will find out. Mm. They always do. Oh, they do always they do. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, and again, people will give you side eye for perfectly fine things. This is a world of side right. eye. But yeah. don't, you know, don't attract more of it, I guess. <laughs> right. No, I right. think that's sound advice. Help it. <laughs> You know, speaking of research, hopefully we're not looking like we haven't done ours a little bit. Uh, but um, well, you went back and read like a 15 year old suppressed transmission essay. I think that counts as research. Oh, thank <laughs> that you. That was actually thank really you. good reading. I mean, yeah. well, yes, but still. Yeah. I mean, do you do you still hold true to most of those things that you've written or have you updated your your opinion on some of these things that you've done in the past in regards to? you know, some of those old, older articles. Well, I mean, the suppressed transmission, I think, hold up pretty well because those were pretty wild speculation and back mm -hmm. and forth. Um, there's some stuff that I did for Deadlands way back in the day where I was, mm -hmm. uh, the mission was to describe the South from the perspective of a, a Southerner. And of course, Deadlands had this wild sort of slavery, but sort of not Confederacy that was very weird um, uh, at the time. Right. And there's things that if I went back now, uh, 20 odd years later and redid, I'd probably redo them a bit, but I wouldn't change, you know, uh, my depiction of, of, of Selma as sort of a South African apartheid Bantu stand taken into the, you know, cowboy times, because that's right. basically what it would have been, but I might've changed some of the, you know, uh, descriptive flavor and some of the other elements of it. So you know, and it, you just learn things that you didn't know. I mean, just factively, uh, there's there's lots of stuff that I know now uh, about the Confederacy or about, you know, uh, the, the Native Americans that I didn't know when I wrote various books. But right. by and large, I think suppressed transmission holds up fairly well. Um, mm -hmm. And I certainly, you know, don't believe that I ever, you know, stepped too far out of the line. But if so, I was doing it on deadline. <laughs> right. Oh, no. Yeah. I, uh, my my, fa my favorite quote is, uh, you know, hey, adding uh, magic to history rocks. 
Yeah. Uh, and, and I, I, you know, support <laughs> that, you know, w- without question, because yeah. that's, that's one of the, that's one of the things that I enjoy about, um, alt history gaming. I mean, Keith, uh, he's, he's the more of the historian of the two of us. Yeah. Uh, he, he loves his, his, not just alt history, but, but, you know, h- historical games and whatnot. For me to get into certain historical games, I need a bit of spice. And usually mm-hmm. that spice is going to be magic or, uh, some sort of odd conspiracy or something happening in the background to make it interesting. Otherwise, I'm just you know playing cowboys and Indians like I did when I was ten in the front yard. Mm-hmm. But um, but it takes much longer to resolve a fight. <laughs> yeah, it, it's true. Very you're true. not wrong. <laughs> but see, you know, the other side of that is like for me, I, I I can play like a purist history type game, and and I am absolutely happy with doing something like that without the mm-hmm. fantastical elements, and I. And I'm in my element. I love it. Yeah. And a, and a good yeah. GM can can make anything fun. And players yep. that are open-minded and uh, ready to enjoy things can absolutely enjoy pure historical gaming. But mm-hmm. I'll just say that, you know, people's preferences are, are revealed by the fact that there is no purely historical game, I think, on the market besides maybe some of the GURPS books. I mean, yeah, every there's... game that I can think of has something uh, magic or elves or vampires or cthulhu or something going on no that's that's absolutely fair (laughs) that's true so the i mentioned conspiracy which kind of brings me into one of the questions that we have from our listeners i might as well slot it in here um our our friend tristan had a you know a, a simple question uh he was curious like what level of research does it take for you when you're going in to make these alt history changes or conspiracy theories is what he essentially posited this question as, as far as how deep do you go before you say, okay, I've got what I need. Let's, let's put this on the paper and, and run with it and make a game with it. Well, I mean, if, if I'm doing it for my game group, I do, mm-hmm. you know, about, you know, three or four hours worth of research to get, you know, the answers to the questions. What happens if I stab that guy who's really running things, those sorts of things. Um, if it's for a publication, a lot, it very much depends on the deadline. Um, I, I think by and large, I have probably never done one of these books without, you know, at least, you know, two or three or five sources just to make sure that I'm getting a parallax view instead of right. just buying one thing down the line. Um, but uh, when I was doing Bookhounds of London, which was not particularly a conspiracy, unless you count Cthulhu as a conspiracy, um, I was uh, just happier than a pig in slop. Uh, I had Victorian guidebooks to London. I had uh, book catalogs from the 1920s, just endless amounts of things that I'm doing it and I'm doing it. And I'm going crazy. And uh, my friend, uh, superb game designer and wonderful human being, Will Hindmarch, was asking me because he wanted to see bookhounds. He said, when's bookhounds coming out? And I said, well, I don't know, Will, I've got, I've got more research to do. And Will says to me, which I have never forgotten for whom. <laughs> <laughs> and if I looked into my secret heart, I was really only doing it for me at that point. Um, right. So that was sort of the, all right, yes, you win, Will. And I did a little bit more where, you know, like North London, I had one or two fewer things, and I had to do a couple of of, of deep uh, dives uh, into my sources. But by and large, yeah, I was done, and I was just doing it to amuse myself. I mean, uh, I, I tell people, certainly in the GMing uh, world, research until you're bored with it, and then you're done. Mm-hmm. Because once you're bored, boredom comes out in the creative end, ah. right? So if I were doing a a, a book, And I've done books that I was bored by, and thank God I quit most of them before they got published. But I've definitely written things. Uh, There was a very dead card game that I was writing the history of their imaginary world for, and I was just utterly, utterly bored with it. And I realized nothing I write is going to be any good. No one will want to read this. I I don't want to read it, and I'm I'm my best audience. (laughs) So, uh, again, if you're writing something for publication, you know, and mm-hmm. you get bored after one book, don't write about that thing because you're going to get much more bored writing it, um, is, is, I guess my advice there. Um, because <laughs> you need to be always interested in what you're making, whether it's at the table or, 
in book form. And, Mm -hmm. you know, my, my great curse is that if they paid me to do nothing but research, I'd be happy. (laughs) (laughs) I think that's true of a lot of people. I think that's like a dream job. Yeah. Yeah, Just let me. So on the topic of books, another listener um, sent in a question. Um, Doc Griffith asked, do you have any good recommendations for speculative history books? He says he's tried a lot of what if books and they've all been kind of, well, a bit dull. He's he's looking for some suggestions from you maybe that are uh, interesting nonfiction, but not necessarily novels. I mean, the the trouble is that uh, it's a very hard road a hoe for a professional historian to write these the the robert cowley what if books about military history those are probably the easiest going what ifs that there are and if he's read those and found them wanting then there may not be anything that he wants to read in that okay. space uh because those are uh they're short uh they're breezy they're usually written by popular historians by which i mean historians whose work has sold more copies than an academic title normally does. And they're about the most exciting thing in the world, which is to say battles. And so if, if those aren't doing it, um, you, you may be out of luck. Uh, there is a, there was an, uh, there are a number of, uh, academic texts about, uh, alternate history that are much harder going than that. Uh, one or two of them, I recommend, I think one or two of them are in the, uh, bibliography of groups infinite worlds in fact okay um but as far as you know historical speculation i might suggest hopping over the fence a little bit and reading like a harry turtle dove novels or um uh, um some of the more historically informed alternate history books um and and see if that is is the jones you're looking for um i just don't uh you know, the, the great crime of it is that if you're a good popular historian, obviously you're going to write about things that actually happened um, and you're going to spend less of your effort writing, you know, alternates. So uh, there's a guy named Peter Suris who has uh, accumulated a lot of various alternate World War II uh, titles. Um, they're all quite good, but many of them are a little stiff because they're written by, you know, at best professional war game designers. Um and again, you know, no one looks at a war game for the pros, uh, by and large. No. Right. Yeah. Uh, he, he may be just wishing for something that doesn't, that, that isn't true. Like I, you know, always wish for Whit Stillman to have done two more Greta Gerwig movies and he didn't do it. So. <laughs> well, I don't think Griff is going to not take any of your suggestions. I'll send him right. uh, the, the bibliography for sure. He, he, yeah. he is a, he devours books. So there's, well, the there's... bibliography from GURPS and Infinite Worlds is on the steve jackson website so oh it is you can just go there and that's what i thought was the state of the art in 2005 or whenever it was i wrote that so okay uh and in the last 15 years there haven't there ha- there hasn't been any real uh game changer produced i don't think okay right excellent so we've got another one here um and this is i think this is more uh our, our friend and friend of the show pookie mm-hmm. i know pookie uh, yep, we everybody yeah, Pookie. knows Pookie. Everyone mm-hmm. knows Pookie. And I think he's just wanting to hear you uh, talk on about something or riff on something. Uh, he was asking for you to provide uh, some sort of conspiracy idea regarding a current event. Just any current event. Uh, Pookie doesn't pro- doesn't provide much beyond that question. He was all right. <laughs> I don't know. This this is uh, I, uh, I I asked Pookie to follow up, and Pookie can be a bit of um, uh, hard to pull stuff out. Of. Yes, exactly, yeah, exactly. Um, I don't know. I mean, the part of the trouble with conspiracizing modern events right. is that people uh, quite rightly take those events seriously. <laughs> no shit. So. <laughs> I mean, you can imagine, uh, uh, certainly you can imagine it more easily than I thought you might have been able to pre-2022, mm-hmm. that uh, Alexander Dugan, the wild, mystical nationalist uh, uh, in Putin's uh, you know cabinet somewhere, uh, had a sort of a secret uh, plan uh, involving the Ukraine, right, that they needed to 
you know, seize the crown of Kherson from Odessa or something. Right. Uh, the the uh, the Nazis when they invaded Ukraine spent a long time looking for the Gothic crown that had been found uh, in one of the archaeological digs. They had a on an Arab guy who accompanied first SS Viking all the way to the Caucasus looking for this crown. And you can argue or you could pretend that the war in Ukraine is actually a big cover for Alexander Dugan trying to seize this artifact so that he can use it for some sort of, you know, occult machination, maybe to erase history and turn Russia into the only template or whatever. But the trouble with playing around with that is there's a legitimate war going on. Uh, and, you know, like something like 45,000 Ukrainian soldiers have died in the war. Right. An ungodly number of civilians have been killed by these rockets. And uh, conspiracy theory is, is like comedy. You require some time. Yeah. Uh, so you and I can have a great time doing conspiracy theories about Napoleon or about the Nazis or even about the Kennedy assassination. If we start doing conspiracy theories on 9-11, then... Maybe we might say, I don't want to do that. Right. That's not the game is not worth the candle to take it all the way down to now is. um, uh, Well, it's 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 a it's a bit uh, sensitive. I mean, my personal alternate history theory about the present is that the Cubs, by winning the World Series in 2016, doomed us all <laughs> that there's a reason the Cubs are not supposed to win the World Series. And it's to prevent this kind of thing from happening. <laughs> The, the seal has been broken and it started in Chicago. So if you go, well, I think it was in Cleveland that they actually won, but which makes sense. Um, but the, uh, but the, if, if, but if you, you know, go back and, and figure out who made that happen, mm -hmm. then you'll figure out who the horrible mastermind behind uh, uh, current events is. Um, but again, you know, we are, we are, uh, we are rich with, uh, conspiracy theories to explain what's happening. Right. And I'm not necessarily sure that the part of wisdom, well, I'm sure the part of wisdom is not, but I'm also not sure the part of taste is to add more to it. Ah. Um, we, we've got, uh, we've got ample dumb theories about things. Um, and again, you know, uh, cons theorizing that someone has swapped out the Ravens at the tower of London for mere crows. And that's why Britain is suddenly going through prime ministers like Italy. Uh, funny but right you know what's what what's the actual point of it right so an an another key thing to think about then you you just you just said it in regards to alt history and gaming is you know definitely you know consider it to be a tasteful somewhat you know try to try to remember that well especially. i mean again publishing is different from your table right yeah if you go to your table and you're talking about your kids you know mm -hmm. these little uh teenagers right to them maybe 9 11 is to me what it what kennedy is right right it's something that happened before I was born, adults were messed up by it. Who cares about adults? They're stupid. Mm -hmm. We're going to go on with our lives. That is actually how everything is ever going to happen. Right. There is a, I believe it's a, I forget if it's a James Blish or an H. Beam Piper. There's a, a novel written sometime in the 60s about um, uh, a bunch of people from a planet named Hitler. <clears throat> and it was just named by the colonists who, who landed there in the 22nd century or whatever. And to them, Hitler was like Napoleon or Cromwell or somebody. It, no actual connection. They just thought, well, that was that was kind of a go-getter guy. Let's name our planet after him. Mm -hmm. And that was sort of the point was this is how far in the future we are is we can name planets after Hitler and no one cares. <laughs> right? Right. You know, okay. at, at, at some point, you know, the, the ocean rolls on. and But I don't think that we're obliged to have it roll on any faster than we are personally comfortable with at the table absolutely no i think that's that's super sound advice yeah um <clears throat> also don't name a planet hitler no people. <laughs> no do not name a planet hitler hear that noah um, don't name a planet hitler <laughs> <laughs> okay well, i think that i think that's the end of our um listener submitted questions yeah. i think that's a good spot to wrap it up if you've got any like any reattacks can you anything we missed do you want to you want to throw in there for listeners before we wrap it up? I mean, I think I've I've hit all the high point plugs, even did some uh, deep dives with GURPS Madness dossier, which yeah. is currently now available uh, even in print. I think that Steve has just uh, put it out in actual soft cover. So rush out and get that. Uh, Wild Talents, uh, GURPS Infinite Worlds, please listen to the podcast. Yep. Uh, Ken and Robin talk about stuff.com, wherever fine podcasts like this one are available. Mm -hmm. Um and I am 
in the process of writing Hellenistica, which will be the good parts of history, uh, the, the, the fun part of the Hellenistic era, uh, with, with magic and monsters and active gods. Uh, so I guess that is a third kind of alternate history where it's not a secret. Uh, people know about all the magic and monsters and gods. It's just that the history is still pretty much working the way it did. Right. But it's more fun. Cool. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> a, a glam, a glow up history. Is, I guess what you can call it. <laughs> okay. That's a, that's a new one for, uh, for the list of different types of histories. Glow mm-hmm. up. All yeah. right. We'll run with it. Excellent. Oh, Ken, I really appreciate your time. I, I'm glad that, uh, you know, we were able to get you on to the podcast and everything. Yeah, so. I'm uh, I'm glad that we were able to overcome various obstacles in, induced by hurricanes <laughs> or myself. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I'm glad uh, the fall of Delta Green does not burn as quick as other books do. So that's uh, <laughs> well, that's 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 Pelgrane's promise to you. <laughs> Second printing. That'll be a blurb on the back of the cover. Yeah. You know. Yep. Um, <laughs> Play it on the coals of your favorite fire. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Well, thank you so much. Uh, Keith, would you like to take us out? Yeah. Hey, everybody. Thanks for tuning in, listening to us chat with Ken. Ken, thank you for taking your time to hang out with Scott and I. And uh, for the benefit of our listeners, we greatly appreciate it. Uh, we know you're busy and your expertise on this subject of alternate history is has been eye-opening. I've got ample notes that I've written down, so I, I will definitely take that to the to the creative drawing board for some projects I'm working on myself. So I appreciate it. And I'll reference back to some of your older books uh, on the subject as well. um, So I can deep dive it myself. So with that, again, thank you on behalf of Scott and I and all of our listeners. And with that, we are going to roll on out of here. Hey, listeners, Scott and Keith here. Thanks again for listening to another episode of Titter Pigs. Yes, thank you. If you enjoyed this episode, be sure and give us a good rating or comment on your podcast listener of choice. Hey, you can also follow us on Twitter at Titter Pigs. And if you'd like to drop us an email or a voice comment, email us at titterpigspod at gmail.com. Once again, everyone, thank you all for listening. And as always, happy gaming. Thank you.